Hi, I'm Philip Samayoa, VP of Portfolio Development at Generation Bio. Thanks for the opportunity to share our company story with you today um, and our vision to create a new class of gene therapy, one that's not only durable, but is also redosable, and one which is not only applicable to patients with rare disorders, but can also be extended to larger diseases, more prevalent diseases, um, and have more of a global reach. Here's our disclosure statement. Um, so to realize this vision, we've built a non-viral gene therapy platform um, really based on breakthrough innovations in three key elements, uh, construct, our delivery system, and our manufacturing system. All three of these elements are fully integrated and capsid free, allowing us to scale our platform and very importantly, allowing us to have a rapid research cycle with which to launch new programs, leading us to a named, program, named portfolio of eight programs in the liver and retina, five in the liver, three in the retina, and expansion opportunities in new tissues like muscle, tumor, and CNS. We have an exceptional leadership team um, of researchers and drug developers with a combined 40 plus INDs between this group and a pretty remarkable R&D organization behind them. We've been lucky enough to have a really supportive group of investors over the past three and a half years, having raised over $450 million to date, um, recently completing our IPO over the summer, um, fully virtually, which was a fun process, um, and now have cash on hand to take us through our first IND, which is targeted through in 2022. When we set out to build this company, we really wanted to build on the successes of previous generations of gene therapy notably the durable transgene expression, but overcome some of the severe limitations um, of these first generation gene therapies, notably the ability to only dose once, the constrained cargo capacity, and the limited manufacturing scale. So for our platform, we brought together a feature set that allows durable expression, redosing, large cargo capacity, and a scalable manufacturing platform, which we think in total is very important for um, providing the best gene therapy possible for patients, physicians, and payers. For patients, this ability to dose more than once and not have an immune response against the gene therapy platform is very important for being able to extend the treatment to all patients. For pediatric patients, this has been a big issue as many of these patients will require a second dose as their target tissue grows. For physicians, the ability to go after new diseases and for existing diseases, the ability to treat patients more than once and get every single patient into the desired therapeutic range. And for payers, just the ability to have a more predictable clinical outcome. Um, if the initial dose of a gene therapy should wane, this ability to come back and retreat um, and bring everybody back into the therapeutic range is very important. And we've seen it manifest regulatory-wise as well, where the unpredictability between uh, trials and between treatments um, and the potential lack of durability has led to delays in some of the initial clinical studies. When we look at our platform, there's three key elements. The construct, which we call closed-ended DNA, or SEDNA, um, which is structurally and functionally very similar uh, to the AAV genome and functionally provides expression uh, for the life of non-dividing cells. Secondly, our CTLNP, or cell-targeted LNP platform, which builds on previous successes in LNP um, directed therapeutics, but now adds a targeting ligand that gives very precise biodistribution to target cells of interest. In our case, initially hepatocytes uh, in the liver. And lastly, we have a capsid-free manufacturing system, which uniquely enables scale to be able to now go after diseases um, that are larger and have potentially millions of patients. We've protected all three elements of this platform with thir over 38 patent families and are continuing to invest and develop these technologies. Um, in our company. Moving on to our portfolio, um, we've selected our lead indications based on a rapid path to clinical proof of concept and established clinical endpoints with lead indications that are mechanistically tied to our follow-on programs. So for example, for secreted protein in the, in the liver, we're starting with hemophilia A, A where we secrete factor VIII protein, followed by Gaucher disease and antibody gene therapy. For intracellular targets in the liver, we're beginning with PKU, and follow on in, in Wilson disease. Likewise, for the retina, we've begun with LCA10 and Stargardt, followed by wet AMD. And beyond all this, we're applying our platform to additional expansion opportunities, as shown on this slide. We're using our flexibility of delivery system and vector to expand the platform into both new tissues and new mechanisms. And within each, our strategy is to nominate a lead program like Hemophilia A, 
for secreted proteins, demonstrate human proof of concept, and then take advantage of our unique eight-week research cycle that allows us to pre-fill a pipeline and move quickly from idea to in vivo proof of concept. So we follow on the initial program with additional rare disease programs like Gaucher, Pompa, and HAE. And then beyond this, we, we, our ambition is to move into more prevalent disorders like SARS-CoV-2 and HIV. The idea behind these applications is that we can take advantage of our large cargo capacity to express full-length monoclonal antibodies, expressing both the heavy and the light chain off of a single construct, and then using the liver to provide durable expression and secretion of the antibody for patients. This is in contrast to having to dose every three to six months with traditional passive administration of, the, of, of these therapeutic monoclonal antibodies. In order to enable indications of this size, we've invested heavily and established um, a capsid-free manufacturing process, um, which we've demonstrated at 200 liter scale with efficiencies and yields similar to that of biologics-based manufacturing. We've begun to tech transfer this process to a CGMP facility and because we can tap into traditional biologics infrastructure, we have the ability to rapidly scale this and expand the number of suites that we're using to support our IND, um, our initial INDs and our first clinical programs. Because we're capsid free and we're not volumetrically limited in the same way that AAV has been, we believe that we're gonna be able to break free of the about thousand liter uh, scale that AAV has traditionally stopped at and move into tens of thousands of liter scales to be able to then um, generate the number of doses required to treat millions of patients. And in reaching these scales, be able to bring the cogs of production down to the level of traditional biologics-based production. Moving on to the platform, first introducing the construct itself and showing visually how it compares to the AAV genome. It's actually quite similar um, with flanking ITRs, but it's fully closed-ended and duplex or double-stranded. The big difference is that because it's capsid free, you aren't cargo constrained to the about 4.7 KB um, open reading frame limitation that AAV is, and we've gone up to about 12 KB um, in some of our initial work. This large cargo capacity offers a number of advantages for existing programs. Just the ability to swap in promoters or different UTRs of different sizes allows us to further optimize expression. Secondly, we can incorporate larger proteins than can be packaged with an AAV. So our retinal programs, CEP290 and ABCA4, allow us to package the full length construct and express the full transgene of interest. Thirdly, the ability to go after multiple mechanisms. I mentioned antibody gene transfer, so the ability to express two proteins off of a single construct. And lastly, we can think about more um, creative ways of regulating expression using endogenous promoters to drive wild type levels of expression in the target cell types as we think about disease correction uh, for some of our programs. One of these examples is shown on this slide for our lead program, Factor 8, um, where we demonstrate the ability to swap in new promoters and new UTRs to be able to drive higher levels of expression um, than some of the leading AAV clinical ca candidates um, that, that are being progressed today. So constructs one through three are actually those clinical candidates cloned into our Sedna vector. And then that compares to our Sedna number one and Sedna number two that show anywhere from five to tenfold increases in expression over the comparing constructs by virtue of being able to optimize the promoter UTR and open reading frame. Now moving on to our LMP delivery system, um, this now shows you what happens when we combine Sedna with an LMP and dose intravenously to drive liver-based expression. On the plot on the left, you can see an intracellular protein, a luciferase, um, after a single administration showing six months of unattenuated expression um, until we took the experiment down. Likewise, on the right, a single administration of a factor IX construct demonstrates secretion and expression of that protein for two and a half months after a single administration. We think this is very similar to AAV, and you'll have unattenuated expression in the target cell type as long as the cell um, is alive if it's non-dividing. The most important experiment that I'm going to show you is the next one, where we now dose in immunocompetent animals a second time and show that we can have dose proportional increases in expression after that second dose. So on the left, this is an increased dose of luciferase, and you can see um, that boost of expression. And on the right, now we're dosing a second time with the factor IX construct at the same dose and you see approximately a doubling of expression from 10% to 
This is the experiment that essentially AAV can't do today because you have an immune response to, an, to the first dose of an AAV-based gene therapy. And on the right, this is the example of titrating dose for a patient where we can think about now lowering the initial dose that we give to a patient, monitoring what level of expression they have, and then retreating as necessary to get every patient into a consistent um, and reliable range of expression to treat the disease. A little bit more specifics about the delivery system. Um, we're using a ligand-directed um, CTLNP going after GALNAC for the liver. So on the plot on the left, you can see the biodistribution of our sedna vector to that liver target versus all of the other clearance organs combined, in this case, the lung, spleen, kidney, and blood. And you can see that over 97% of the dose cumulatively goes to the liver as opposed to those organs. On the right, if you look at the middle panel, this is now comparing the biodistribution of a previous generation LNP. This is the uh, first gen sort of MC3-like LNP that's been developed for RNAi type therapies. And you can see almost equal distribution to the spleen and the liver. Now this is very important for non-viral gene therapy in that the spleen is composed largely of immune cells. So this can introduce dose limitation and an inability to get the right level of exposure to the liver, allowing disease correction. In our case, on the plot on the very right, the CTLNP, you can see that we've essentially zeroed out exposure to the spleen and driven very specific and high levels of exposure into the liver. Beyond being able to enable us to go after our lead programs in the liver, this is also very exciting and that it allows us to think about delivery to new tissues. By avoiding systemic clearance to immune cells and clearance organs like the spleen and the liver, we can now swap the targeting ligand to go after myofibers for the muscle or cancer cells and tumor and be able to go after new disease targets in those tissues. Likewise, in local tissues like the retina, this avoidance of immune cells, in particular glial cells, allows us to have the type of tolerability and potency in our target cell types, the RPE and the photoreceptors, to be able to give us therapeutic levels of expression. And we think this will extend to the CNS where we can avoid glial cells and potentially deliver to neuronal cell types. So now looking forward, we have a, a number of exciting milestones coming up over the coming years. We're developing our disease proof of concept in PKU and HEME this year, leading to IND enabling work over the next year and an IND submission in 2022. In our follow-on programs like the retina and other tissues, we're beginning to do platform optimization, leading to lead optimization in the next year. On the manufacturing front, we've established our CGMP process at 200 liters and are beginning to scale this um, to thousand and multi-thousand liter scales over the coming years. So I wanna take some time and, and thank you for, for hearing our story um, and our vision to create a, a new class of gene therapy that's durable, redosable, um, and importantly accessible to a broader range of diseases. If we can achieve this vision and be able to deliver a more consistent and accessible gene therapy, we'll be able to treat more diseases and more patients. And as our CEO uh, likes to say, um, if, if we can have this type of profile, you may be able to have um, kids grow up with genetic disease and not remember the disease that they were born with. So that's what we're pushing towards and, and that's what we think our technology can do. Um, so we look forward to, to chatting with you about it um, and thank you.